evening and welcome for the optimal use of factor 10A inhibition for critical limb ischemia assessing the latest data. You know, I believe that nothing is more important in our field than making sure that we first make sure that we ensure optimal medical therapy on our patients. And all too often as interventionists, we jump to step three or step four, but often we fail to, to absolutely optimize medical therapy, and that is indeed uh, a mistake. So this program is supported by an educational grant from Janssen Scientific Affairs. My name is Craig Walker. I'm an interventional cardiologist. I founded Cardiovascular Institute of the South, which is a large cardiology group, which has grown now to 90-plus interventional cardiologists and about 1,100 employees now. Uh, I am also a clinical professor of medicine at both Tulane Medical School and at Louisiana State University Medical School, and I'm the editor of Vascular Disease Management in Javelin. Uh, joining me tonight are two very distinguished uh, speakers, John Evans to my far right. John is a podiatrist and certainly is board certified. Uh, he is the chief of podiatry at Beaumont Dearborn Hospital in Michigan. Uh, he's on the health, health policy and practices committee, chair emeritus uh, of that. And uh, he's, of course, a member of all of the podiatric societies there. It's certainly a world-class podiatrist who's contributed tremendously in this field of trying to save limbs and improve peripheral vascular care. To my near right is Dr. Eric Dippel. Eric is a really wonderful interventional cardiologist. He's been a great friend of mine for years, travels through China and other things with me. But Eric is one of the early great proponents of office-based labs, and he has an office-based lab in Bettendorf, Iowa, and has done really remarkable things there. Now, Eric has a very interesting background. He was first a biomechanical engineer before becoming um, a cardiologist, and so Eric has a unique perspective in the field, and I think that unique perspective makes him likewise yet more uh, uh, yet more able to realize the importance of medical care. So today's learning objectives for this meeting, and we're filming this, by the way, is to evaluate the most recent clinical data on overall efficacy and safety of factor 10A inhibitors in the management of peripheral arterial disease. To assess the role of factor 10A inhibitors in combination with aspirin, to prevent major adverse limb effects as well as major adverse cardiovascular uh, adverse events. To apply appropriate patient selection criteria and management practices for treatment with factor 10A inhibitors. And so with that, we're going, going to delay no further. It is indeed my pleasure to ask Dr. John Evans to come up and speak to us on the COMPASS trial. Thank you, Dr. Walker, and good evening to everybody here. I really appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, as Dr. Walker was kind enough to mention that I'm a podiatrist. I practice in Michigan. Uh, so it's an honor to be with two esteemed cardiovascular specialists on this as kind of the, the outside person. But I'm a podiatrist, have been for almost 35 years. Uh, so I'm used to dealing with people with issues regarding the foot, the leg. But prior to that, my initial interest in the topic we're going to be talking about tonight is my first degree was in pharmacy. And so for over 40 years, I have been, have had a true love of pharmacology. So anything that comes across my desk that has to do with how drugs might work in different ways uh, has been interesting. So about four years ago, I became aware of the uh, study that I'm going to speak to you about tonight, uh, the COMPASS trial. And it really resonated with me in a way that my, my profession really hadn't understood 
yet, because they weren't aware of this, the implications it would have to lower extremity disease and certainly to my colleagues as podiatrists. First, just a little bit of background, which I'm speaking to the choir here, you already know this. We know that PAD is a severe disease affecting many people around the globe. We're talking about the classic definition of PAD, which begins with atherosclerotic disease in the arterial vessels, where there's a plaque rupture, we get a thrombosis, inflammation of the vessels leads to activation of platelets and clotting factors, which will lead to thrombi and atherosclerotic changes within the vessels themselves. So it's important to us to figure out how can we interrupt this pathophysiologic process. And up to recently, we didn't have a whole lot of things we could do. We knew if we lowered lipids, it would help. Uh, we knew if we used some antiplatelet drugs, it could help. But again, most of the literature has been geared towards uh, really cardiac events, things like this. And peripheral arterial disease was just a byproduct. Oh, yeah, they had PAD too, so we'll see how they did. So most of the guidelines that we have today have to do with people who had cardiac disease or maybe stroke, but certainly not directly PAD. In the past, we've looked at different ways of how to deal with this. Uh, we've looked at the single and dual antiplatelet therapies, uh, which were somewhat effective, <coughs> but not as much as we would like. And then we've known that anticoagulation uh, with and without antiplatelet therapies could be useful. We've known this since the middle of last century, that patients who were on Coumadin and aspirin had less cardiovascular events, but the bleeding risks outweighed the use of using it. So we've been trying to figure out a way around this for a while. So tonight, we're going to basically be talking about uh, two drugs, an anticoagulant and an antiplatelet agent. And first, the antiplatelet agent we're talking about is our old friend aspirin. We all know how this works, specifically as a COX-1 inhibitor, sometimes COX-2 in higher doses, affects prostaglandin synthesis and basically leads to lower activation uh, and uh, the accumulation of platelets together during the atherosclerotic process. But we're also going to be talking about a newer agent, uh, a selective direct factor 10A inhibitor, rivaroxaban. And rivaroxaban has been around for a while. It has a whole lot of indications, actually more than any other of these uh, <coughs> direct oral anticoagulant agents for different con conditions and in different doses. So we're talking about looking at those together. Now, you're all familiar with the, cl the clotting cascade here. But basically in this, between the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, factor system, we get down to factor 10. And if 10 is activated, it will affect the prothrombin to thrombin cascade, and then from fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin is what we see mostly in the atherosclerotic clots and stuff. So if we can deal with thrombin, we can reduce the development of fibrin, and we can indirectly reduce some of the activation of platelets. So rivaroxaban, as I say, has been around for a while. A lot of indications, but most of us are going to see patients who have AFib, DVT, or PEs. Uh, the dose, <laughs> full dose of this is around 15 to 20 milligrams a day. Now, the direct oral anticoagulant agents got some bad press about five years ago because there were bleeding issues, and we didn't have a way of treating these uh, potential overdoses. Now we do. There's a factor 10A inhibitor that's available to our healthcare system, so it's not as concerned as it was before, but for a while it was important. But the question we're looking at tonight is, could a low-dose rivaroxaban in combination with low-dose aspirin reduce the risk of major complications of cardiovascular disease, and in our case, PAD? 2017, the COMPASS trial was published. Now, probably most of you are familiar with this. It was a major change in the potential therapeutic options for PAD <coughs> and cardiovascular disease. It was a big study. Global, over or 600 sites, 33 countries. And basically what it looked at was over 27,000 patients with stable atherosclerotic vascular disease. 
and the mean age was around 68. 91 percent of the patients had coronary disease, but over a quarter of them had PAD. And the primary outcome of this study was to look at the effect of different types of pharmacologic therapy on cardiovascular deaths, stroke, and MI. And they looked at a three-pronged uh, evaluation. One was rivaroxaban, five milligrams twice daily. The second arm was aspirin, 100 milligram daily, baby aspirin dose. And the third was a low dose rivaroxaban, a 2.5 milligram dose with aspirin. The 2.5 milligram dose was twice a day. So if you think about it, we're talking about a dose that's about a quarter of the full strength dose that most of us are used to if we're dealing with other dis thrombotic disease states. The main concern we were, safety profile, was bleeding. So they used a modified ISTH <coughs> guideline for this. Now the classic ISTH guideline looks at major bleeding with a definition of fatal bleeding, symptomatic bleeding into a critical organ, I apologize for leaving that text out, or bleeding into a surgical site that required reoperation. But they added another item to that list, bleeding that led to a presentation to acute care facility or hospital. Basically, anything that would bring a patient back into a physician's office for whatever reason, nosebleed, GI bleed, bruising, anything like that. They made it a tougher category to look at. So the trial was supposed to go for about three years. But they stopped it early. They stopped it at about 23 months. And rarely do you see a pharmacologic study stopped because it's too good. Because they found there was clear evidence of efficacy of the low-dose rivaroxaban and baby aspirin dose compared to the other ones. So it wasn't ethical to continue it. What they were looking at is a composite of what they call major adverse cardiovascular events, which is cardiovascular death stroke, or heart attack. They found that the dose of low-dose rivaroxaban with baby aspirin reduced the composite risk of those events by 24 percent compared with aspirin alone. The bleeding risk was <coughs> higher. There was a 3.1 percent versus 1.9 percent, so it's about like 1.2 percent of higher risk of bleeding as compared to just baby aspirin alone. And primarily, the majority of this bleeding were, was GI. When you look at the more severe causes, the bleeding causing death or requiring operation or into a critical organ, uh, the statistical numbers were pretty much the same. But even more important to our group, they looked at a subgroup of this that was published in the following year by Sonia Anand, where she looked at the patients who had PAD within the COMPASS trial. So they had almost 6,400 patients who had PAD from the COMPASS trial. During the trial, 128 of them developed a major adverse limb event, which I'll talk about in just a second. But to be part of this group, you basically had to have one of these criteria. You have to have had a previous bypass or intervention of some sort, an amputation, have confirmed by objective measures intermittent claudication, limb ischemia, Fontaine, <coughs> class 3 or 4, or coronary disease with an ABI of less than 0.9. So these were not patients with a little PAD. These were the kind of patients that we see. Now, they looked at a definition of a major adverse limb event as being one that has severe limb ischemia that requires an intervention of some sort, whether it's bypass or intervention endovascular or amputation or thrombolysis, or a patient who had a major amputation above the forefoot. So these are the definition of an MALE, a major adverse limb event that we talk about during this study and the studies that uh, Dr. Dipple and Dr. Walker will be talking about in just a minute. Now the objectives of Anand's study were basically twofold. One, are hospitalizations, <coughs> MACE, amputations and deaths higher after the first episode of an MALE event compared with PAD patients who had not had one. So in effect, they were looking at how dangerous is it for our patients to have a major adverse limb event. 
And secondly was an extension of the COMPASS trial. Uh, the effect of rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus aspirin alone in the uh, effect of not just the major adverse cardiovascular events, but the limb events, the MALE, and the need for future, future uh, vascular interventions and all vascular outcomes. So the, the answer to the first question is, after one of your patients has an MALE, MALE which means after they have an intervention or a bypass or an amputation like that, the risk of subsequent hospitalization goes up seven times. The risk of amputation goes up 200 times. And the risk of death goes up three times. So it's not healthy to have an MALE, because if you survive it, this is what your future looks like. Now, the second part had to do with the low-dose rivaroxaban plus baby aspirin versus aspirin alone. And they found that that combination of therapy will reduce the risk of an MALE by 46%. It'll reduce the need for peripheral vascular interventions by 24% and reduce amputation risk by 67%. It also reduces the risk of critical limb ischemia by 33% and reduce of straight uh, the acute limb ischemia by 44%. So we have a pharmacologic treatment that actually intervenes in the pathophysiological process of developing atherosclerosis. So conclusions from COMPASS, people who have PAD and suffer an MALE have a poor outlook after that point, with the hospitalization risk of seven times, amputation risk of 200 times, and that just gets to me, or death risk by three times, and that the low-dose rivaroxaban plus baby aspirin reduces the risk of MALE 46%, with amputations down 67%, interventions by 24%, but also that the major cardiovascular events that vascular death, heart attack, and stroke by 24%. Bleeding is still an issue. We'll keep bringing this up. <coughs> but when you look at the statistical values, every day when you are treating a patient, you're going to do a risk-benefit ratio in your mind. You're going to try to figure out what's the best, <coughs> safest, least riskful way. Now, we know that if we're going to deal with anticoagulant agents, antiplatelet agents, bleeding is an issue. But in a situation like this, we're looking at something that, for the majority of our patients, and Dr. Dippel and Dr. Walker will be talking about this more where it's appropriate, it certainly is something we should be thinking about. And many of us maybe aren't aware of this information, even though this was a big study. So basically, we have a pharmacologic therapy that can have a, pro a profound treatment option affecting PAD limb salvage and our patients who are suffering from wounds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. That was a lovely, a lovely review. Now, Dr. Eric Dimple is going to speak to us about the Voyager trial. Uh, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, it's always a pleasure and honor to share the stage with you. I also want to thank Jihad, who's hiding in the back, mm -hmm. for putting on a wonderful meeting and the opportunity to be here. Thank you for all the effort you do. I know there's a lot of work that goes into this. Um, what I want to do for the next few minutes is talk a little bit about the Voyager trial, which is an extension of the COMPASS trial. But just to kind of rehash and put this in perspective, the COMPASS trial was designed for patients that had stable atherosclerotic disease. Uh, and it was designed to look at all patients, cardiovascular disease, CAD, and peripheral arterial disease. The Voyager trial specifically is looking at uh, post-intervention patients after you've had a revascularization. Surprisingly uh, to me, uh, believe it or not, in 2021, there is no level of evidence, one, uh, of how to treat patients what is the appropriate throm antithrombotic therapy after you put a peripheral stent in? There is no randomized data 
to guide what we do until the Voyager trial came out. This is a historic landmark trial, and I want to emphasize that over and over again because this really will set the stage of how we move forward after we put stents in patients. So, you know, I think any talk about the clotting cascade and antithrombotic therapy wouldn't be complete uh, unless we tried to confuse everybody up front. Um, I remember sitting in medical school uh, in the lecture hall the first time they showed a slide like this, went through the clotting cascade, and they talked about factor two, and then they talked about factor five, and I said, well, wait a minute, where's factor three and four? And then they skipped up to seven, and I said, well, what about factor six? And then they went on factor 10, and they were talking about the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway, and I was so confused at the end, I thought, thank God I'll never have to know this again mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So 30 years later, I'm standing up here talking about it. But you know, blood is kind of a wonderful, wonderful medium, if you will. It has the ability to go from a liquid to a solid in a matter of seconds uh, through a magnification and amplification pathway. And, and it's kind of interesting, it's evolutionary if you think about it, because you know, when you got bit by the saber-toothed tiger, obviously you wanted your blood to stop bleed, clot quickly so you didn't bleed to death. But it's also pathologic in the sense that when it clots in your LED or clots in your SFA or your tibial arteries, it can cause life and limb threatening events. So how do we modulate that in a way that we can, um, you know, not make the blood clot or bleed excessively? And that's really what we're getting at when we're, when we're doing interventions. Anytime you put a balloon in an artery, anytime you put a stent in an artery or an atherectomy device, you're disrupting the artery, you're tearing up the endothelium, you're, you're exposing the blood to the things that make blood clot, collagen, von Willebrand factor, et cetera, and so you're prone to clot, and that's really kind of where we're at. So I want to kind of step back for a minute and talk about how we got to this point, because the, the anticoagulant of choice for almost 80 years now has been heparin. Heparin was uh, uh, released and uh, uh, developed in the 1940s, uh, we use this every day. We don't think much about it, but heparin is an incredibly impure molecule. It's an incredibly heterogeneous molecule. It has incredible variable results. Uh, vial by vial is not consistent dosing. Interpersonal and interpersonal dosing is also variable. So if I give myself 5,000 units and I give Craig 5,000 units, we're going to have to two totally different ACTs. If I give myself 5,000 units today and myself 5,000 units tomorrow, I'll get two totally different ACTs because of the variability of it. And, and if, you're, you know, if you're doing interventions right now without checking ACTs, and shame on you, and we can talk about that later, but that's a whole other discussion. But I wanted, to say, I wanted to mention this here. If you ever have an inkling that you want to make some heparin on your own, this is the recipe that is used, and this is exactly how it's made today. You can go down to the slaughterhouse, and you can buy 5,000 pounds of intestines, Usually it's cow, uh, sometimes it's pork, but it, uh, heparin is a, a product that is in all of us, all mammals. You take 200 gallons of water and some chloroform and some toluene, you hold that at 70 degrees for 17 hours. You add 30 gallons of acetic acid, 35 gallons of ammonia, some sodium hydroxide, adjust the pH, then add some more water, bring it to a boil, and then you filter it. You add some more water and filtrate it, and you allow it to stand overnight. And then I like this term, you skim off the fat, okay? Then you keep the pancreatic extract at 100 degrees for three days, and then you filter it and you assay for heparin content. So we've gone from this incredibly heterogeneous <laughs> molecule that we use as a shotgun approach to trying to interrupt the clotting cascade to a very specific targeted synthetic molecule that will interrupt factor 10A and cause the clotting cascade to stop immediately. And so that's just kind of a perspective of where we're at. So then I started thinking about um, the history of angioplasty and how have we gotten to where we're at today. Um, some of you may be familiar with these, this data, some of you may not, but angioplasty really started actually in the 60s with Charles Dodder and then later Andreas Grunzig in the mid-70s. But one of the initial concerns with angioplasty was both clotting after the vessel was intervened on but also, how do you get the sheaths out and how do you provide, prevent access bleeding, access site bleeding? And, uh, and so, in the initial era of stents, the st first stents that came out were designed by Ehrlich Sigvart from Germany, which later became the wall stent. That's the first self-expanding stent. And Julio Palmaz developed the first balloon expandable stent. Both of those, within about 
nine to 12 months of each other. But the initial stent anticoagulation reg uh, uh, regimen is kind of listed on the upper left. All patients got heparin, aspirin, dextran, diprotamol, and Coumadin. They're maintained on a heparin drip for five to seven days until the Coumadin became therapeutic. <coughs> patients were kept in the hospital for seven days after they had a coronary stent because they were afraid that it was gonna thrombose and that could be a fatal event. I remember when I was an intern uh, at the VA hospital in Iowa City, uh, I was doing the CCU my first month, and they put in the very first coronary stent in a patient at the VA hospital there. And I was on call one night, and the patient had come back from the cath lab. He had nine French sheaths and both groins. <laughs> he was on a heparin drip. And I remember the fellow stuck his finger in my face, and he said, don't stop the heparin no matter what. And I kind of looked at him and said, okay. And the patient had expanding hematomas in both groins. He said, if the nurse calls you and they think that the hematomas have gotten bigger, you take this Sharpie marker and you draw another line on the skin, <laughs> like rings on a tree. And then you call me and that's all you do. And I said, yes, sir, okay. And that was how, that's how we managed uh, stent patients 30 plus years ago. Um, then uh, Antonio Colombo came along and presented some data that if you used high pressure balloon inflations to kind of get the stent more embedded into the wall of the artery, you, you had less gaps, less prone to bleeding, and so the anticoagulation regimen started to change. It was the French multicenter registry that first suggested that ticlopidine may be a viable alternative to uh, Coumadin and heparin. And then there was a series of studies that came in the early uh, and mid 1990s that were randomized trials comparing the cumin and heparin strategy versus the, what I call the dual antiplatelet strategy of ticlopidine and aspirin. And when you looked at the dual antiplatelet uh, uh, regimen across the board, those patients did better. They had less bleeding outcomes. Uh, they had better, uh, 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 less stunt thrombotic episodes. And then and there was a series of randomized trials uh, that, that supported that. The problem with ticlopidine was that it had a relatively slow onset of action. It took several days, about three to four days, before it got the full <laughs> antiplatelet effect, so patients had to be loaded, and you still had that gap in, in antiplatelet therapy. Uh, and there was a, a subset of patients that had uh, a rare event called thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, and they had a severe life-threatening uh, bleeding complications from that. And so, Plavix clopidogrel came along in the late 1990s and uh, showed superior outcomes to ticlopidine, and that really kind of changed the era of what we do today. And that led to the DAPT era that I call it from about 1995 till just recently. Uh, there's been a number of different ADP agonists out there now, Prosegrel and Ticaglor have been around, um, but that's really kind of been the foundation of our strategy. Uh, in the around 2010, uh, that's when some of these uh, novel, anti, novel oral uh, anticoagulants uh, came out, the NOAC drugs, the oral 10A inhibitors, oral thrombin inhibitors. And then we started having a new problem, is that these drugs have multiple different uh, indications, AFib, DVT, et cetera. So what if you have a patient that's on um, rivaroxaban, for example, for <coughs> AFib, but now they get a coronary stent and they need aspirin and Plavix. So is there, what's the concern about bleeding? What's the concern of efficacy? And so is there, there was a whole series of studies in the early 2010s on, quote, triple therapy uh, versus double therapy. Then along came in the last year or so uh, the Voyager trial, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about. But the key that I want to point out is that every one of these studies up to this point, they've all been coronary studies. Not one of these studies is a peripheral artery stenting study. All the data that we have on peripheral artery stenting, when you put a stent in an iliac or stent in an SFA or tibial artery, is extrapolated from what we do in the coronary literature. We have no level of evidence, level evidence one data for what to do with PAD patients after stenting. And that's why the Voyager study, in my opinion, is a landmark trial that will set the precedence of how we treat these patients and will become part of the guidelines when they get revised. So with PAD, we know that this is a thrombotic process. Uh, this is a, a series of patients that looked at autopsy specimens of legs that were amputated both below the knee and above the knee. And uh, there is a, a large burden of thrombotic material in these arteries after they've been looked at on pathologic specimens. And so how do we treat that? Again, that gets back to what John was talking about from the COMPASS data of treating this from a medical standpoint and then post-intervention.
So getting back to the clotting cascade, if we have a, an effective way to inhibit thrombin therapy, an effective way to inhibit platelet therapy, that should wipe out the majority of the clot that forms, and that's indeed what we see uh, in, the, in the trials that, the, that I'm gonna present here. Some more of the background, when you look at major adverse limb events, uh, again, this gets back to what we're talking about. There's an early uh, phase where patients have uh, acute problems, acute thrombosis from the arteries after you've disrupted the endothelium, but then long-term, there's still events that continue to occur, and so how do we prevent those going forward? Uh, it's already been mentioned that patients that have acute limb events have higher outcomes, higher negative outcomes, their hospitalizations are longer, they have a higher mortality rate, they have a higher amputation rate, they have prolonged stays in the ICU, uh, uh, many of them go on to major surgery. And so again, how do we make these patients uh, uh, have better outcomes with less bleeding complications? And that's where the Voyager study comes from. Voyager is a vascular outcome study of aspirin along with rivaroxaban and endovascular surgical limb revascularization for peripheral artery disease. This is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, uh, just uh, last year. The Voyager study design, uh, this was uh, a large randomized trial, 6,500 patients. All patients were undergoing a type of revascularization. They were uh, stratified between surgical revascularization and endovascular uh, revascularization. All patients received an aspirin. Uh, they were randomized between rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice a day, or placebo. Patients were allowed to be put on clopidogrel at the discretion of the uh, interventionalist or the operator, and there was a stratification uh, uh, with that as well so that that became, uh, came out as a wash in, in, in the end. Um, and then uh, the follow-up <laughs> was for major adverse limb events, which were acute limb ischemia, major amputation, and the traditional cardiac events of death MI and revascularization. The principal safety outcome was uh, Timmy major bleeding, and the median follow-up was out to 28 months. This again was a global trial, uh, which I think speaks to the quality of the data when you're dealing with multiple uh, countries, multiple continents, thousands of patients. Uh, it clearly makes the data robust. Um, here are the baseline characteristics. Uh, the median age of the patients was 67 years old. Uh, you can see the traditional risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, and so forth were well balanced between the study groups. And the procedural endpoints or the procedural uh, characteristics of the patients, uh, 95 to 96 percent of these patients were claudicants. A third of them had a prior history of revascularization. Six percent had a prior history of amputation. The ankle brachial index in both groups was 0.5. Uh, and when you get to that level, that's rather severe PAD. These are not people that are, have mild plaque, but these are severe advanced PAD. A quarter of the patients had critical limb ischemia. Again, in terms of cancer, that's stage four cancer. These people are at the end of the road. Uh, Three-fourths of the patients were claudicants. As far as the stratification uh, regarding the revascularization strategy, a third of the patients uh, underwent surgical revascularization and two-thirds of the patients underwent an endovascular revascularization, and that was balanced between both groups. And here's the primary endpoint, and there's a couple things that I want to point out. This is all cumulative events of acute limb ischemia, major amputation, MI, stroke, and death. And if you look at the absolute risk reduction at six months, it's 1.5 percent, number needed to treat 65. At two year or at one year, it's the absolute risk reduction is 2 percent, number needed to treat is 50. And when you get out to three years, the absolute risk reduction is 2.6, the number needed to treat is 39. In other words, these curves continue to diverge over time. That's point number one. Point number two is that these curves are not zero. So we're not curing people of the problem. They're still, even in the treatment group, there's 17.3% of people are having a primary endpoint out at three years. So we still need to do more to treat these patients. But clearly you can see these curves are diverging over time. We're preventing the acute events, after we're preventing the stent thrombosis, graft failure rates, whatever you want to call them, early, and we're preventing events later on as well, and they continue to separate over time, which I think is, is uh, an important point. When you look at the endpoints on the components of the endpoint, really the primary endpoint was driven by a reduction in acute limb of ischemic events. 
a 33% relative risk reduction in acute limb ischemic events. And this is what we call a cold leg. This is stent thrombosis. This is graft failure. Depending on what discipline you're from, people call it different things. But acute limb ischemia means that basically everything is clotted off. By keeping them on the study treatment arm of rivaroxaban with aspirin, you're reducing the risk of that by 33% at three years. Regarding major vascular amputation, there's an 11% relative risk reduction of major vascular amputation uh, uh, over the three-year period. Regarding the, the safety endpoint of major bleeding, there was a statistically higher number of major bleeding events in the uh, rivaroxaban group, but this did not reach statistical significance, and the absolute risk was 0.27% per year uh, over time. There was no statistical difference in intracranial hemorrhage. There's no statistical difference in fatal bleeding uh, or the combined intracranial hemorrhage or fatal bleeding. So overall, despite the fact that there was a higher number numerically of bleeding events, there were mostly uh, minor bleeding events that were not statistically significant. Regarding post-procedural bleeding, uh, requiring unplanned take back, in other words, access site bleeding or surgical operative site bleeding, uh, there was no difference, uh, and there was no difference in any bleeding <coughs> associated with the revascularization procedure itself. <coughs> so if you look at this in total and you compare the efficacy in the green versus the negative harm in the red, which is the bleeding events, overall there is a six to one benefit to risk ratio profile of improved outcomes versus the risk of having a bleeding event, which I think in these patients, again, as I mentioned, 25% of these patients have stage four cancer. They have CLI. I think a six to one risk benefit ratio is quite acceptable uh, for these patients to try and save their limbs. We know that patients that have a major amputation when they're 70 years old have a 20% mortality at one year. So if we can do whatever we can to save their leg and keep it attached to their body, even if they have a few extra bleeding events uh, that are not fatal bleeding, not intracranial hemorrhage bleeding, I think that's worth the risk and it's quite acceptable. So I want to talk a, a couple, briefly about a couple of the subgroups, specifically about the CLI group. This is, again, looking only at the CLI patients. Uh, this is the same thing. If you look at the cumulative uh, event rate over time, the incidence, uh, the absolute risk reduction is 5.8% at six months, and it increases to 10.2%. So it's even a bigger magnitude of benefit in a sicker population of patients. And that's exactly what you would expect. You get the biggest magnitude of benefit in the patients that are typically the sickest. This compares patients uh, with CLI versus without CLI, and you can see again, the, the with CLI patients have a, a greater magnitude of benefit uh, over time, an absolute risk reduction of 4.5% at three years, the number needed to treat of 23, compared to the non-CLI patients that have an absolute risk reduction of 2.2% and a number needed to treat of 47. This is the unplanned revascularization uh, group uh, in the CLI analysis. And if you look at this, these are the patients that have the stent thrombosis. These are the patients that you put in a stent or you do a balloon or you do an atherectomy and they come back the next day or the next week because it's all clotted off. Well, if you look at that small inset box in the lower left-hand corner, you can see there's a very dramatic separation of these curves very early favoring the rivaroxaban group. And again, this separates out and continues to grow over time. But this shows you the power of using this type of therapy early on, immediately at the time of intervention, and in uh, the, keeping the vessel patent from the very beginning before it clots off. Uh, and, and this is um, an interesting slide. I wanted to throw this in here because this was looking at patients that with clopidogrel versus without clopidogrel. In the overall cohort of patients, clopidogrel did not offer any advantage uh, adding that as triple therapy. But what I do want to point out, uh, if you look at the far left graph, this is patients that had CLI that were treated with clopidogrel. They did, they did derive a benefit from this. And that makes sense to me, and so this is not a uh, this is not a recommendation by Jansen or anything. This is a recommendation by me looking at this data that patients that have CLI do derive a benefit of being treated for plavix. So my treatment strategy has been to put these people on triple therapy for th for 30 days and then cut one of the platelet drugs out, and I'll talk about that some more later. But if you look on the right-hand slide, this is your major bleeding complications. There was no significant increase in major bleeding by adding plavix 
So I think that it's safe to add Plavix to this regimen. You don't get any benefit on patients that, uh, that aren't CLI patients, but particularly the CLI patients, which are the sickest of the sick, I think it's beneficial for that subgroup of patients. Now, I threw this slide in here just to, for as a thought-provoking <laughs> slide because this is a slide that's almost 25 years old now. This is the Capri study. This is a direct head-to-head -head comparison of aspirin and, and clopidogrel uh, looking at the, uh, in the overall effects of MI stroke and death in 19,000 patients. This is a randomized trial. This is another landmark trial back in the mid-1990s. But overall, clopidogrel is a better drug than aspirin. There's no question in my mind. Clopidogrel has a better relative risk reduction, and it has less bleeding complications. Everybody says that Plavix makes people bleed. It's not the Plavix. Aspirin causes mucosal uh, ulceration in the GI tract, and that's where you get the bleeding problems from from aspirin. Clopidogrel does not cause any mucosal ulcerations, and so the bleeding complications actually from clopidogrel are lower. So my thought-provoking question for the evening would be, what if this study was done with the baseline of clopidogrel and rivaroxaban versus, instead of aspirin and rivaroxaban? I think the results would have been even better, personally. But again, that's thought-provoking. That's my opinion. That's not the opinion of Janssen or anybody else. But I want to throw that slide out there to think about it, because I think clopidogrel is a better drug than aspirin, and maybe we should be using clopidogrel and rivaroxaban together. So, in summary, uh, Voyager's PAD study is a landmark study that uh, defines an effective anticoagulation regimen following endovascular revascularization. Again, I think this is a historic study that's going to go forward uh, and define the, the, the guidelines of how we treat patients. In symptomatic patients that have PAD after revascularization, one in five will have an acute limb event, a major amputation, uh, uh, or uh, MI stroke at three years. Uh, the patients that received uh, the rivaroxaban plus aspirin compared to aspirin alone had a, a significant reduction in acute limb ischemic events, a significant reduction in major vascular amputation and unplanned limb revascularizations. There is an increase in bleeding. Uh, this is a numerical increase in Timmy major bleeding that uh, did not have a statistical uh, uh, significance, and there was no in, uh, excess increase in intracranial fatal bleeding. And overall, there are six times as many ischemic events that are prevented versus the bleeding events that are caused. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Eric. And you know, it's always difficult to follow two such great talks. And my job is really going to be to summate this data and hopefully leave a few points of emphasis about um, where do factor 10A inhibitors, what really is going on? Now, in all atherosclerotic events, typically what turns a relatively stable syndrome into an unstable syndrome is the presence of thrombus. Thrombus is what takes stable angina and makes it unstable angina. It is what takes peripheral vascular disease and ultimately turns it into critical limb ischemia. It does this across the board. And how does this happen? Well, we have plaque. Often this plaque ulcerates, exposing subintimal collagen. Platelets adhere, and the clotting cascade is activated. Now, what stimulates platelets to activate? Well, we have an ADP receptor. That is the receptor that is inhibited by drugs such as Plavix. Okay, we have the thromboxane receptor. That can be inhibited by drugs such as aspirin. And finally, we have a PAR1 receptor, which can be stimulated profoundly by thrombin. And in fact, we look at thrombin, we know that if we block thrombin as an antithrombin, it has a direct anticoagulant effect in the clotting cascade. But what we often don't think of, it is also an antiplatelet because Thrombin activation of platelets is one of the strongest activators of platelets. And so some of the thoughts in Compass was to look at this and determine what would happen. Now, we often don't really think, and this is from Compass data, about how sick, this is from REACH trial before this, 
how sick patients with peripheral arterial disease really are. What kills people with peripheral arterial disease usually? Heart attacks and strokes. You know, we always look at these as legs, but we need to look at these as patients. And patients have a lot more to them than just their legs. Their legs are important, and we've seen them for that. But these patients are at risk of death. And why is that? Well, look in the REACH registry. Uh, looking at coronary artery disease patients, these were people who were typically stable but had a diagnosis of coronary disease, and those with peripheral arterial disease. Now, these were just stable peripheral arterial disease patients, and I had those criteria mentioned before, a diminished ABI, prior bypass, prior intervention. But look at the major cardiovascular events at one year and three years. Actually, they were higher. They were higher in the peripheral subgroup than the coronary subgroup. And this has been shown in trial after trial. If you have peripheral arterial disease, you're more likely to die of a heart attack than a heart attack survivor. So if there's one point I want to make here tonight, is a patient with peripheral arterial disease is a cardiovascular patient. They have big issues. And so I think this slide from REACH helps with that. Now, in COMPASS, which was this incredibly large trial, as pointed out by John in the very first talk, if we looked at limb events, the group that had um, uh, adverse limb events, uh, really, uh, we saw a, a tremendous uh, event reduction in these patients uh, as we looked at the incident rates. And unfortunately, I, I realize one of my slides did not come out here. I apologize for this. But anyway, this showed a tremendous reduction in recurrent limb events. Now, in the REACH registry, they looked to see who was most apt to have additional events. And they looked at many things. And so what we, they looked at, shown here in red, was single vascular disease, just simply peripheral arterial disease, or polyvascular disease, involvement of a coronary and a peripheral vascular vessel or a carotid vessel. And across the board, what was seen is that if you have polyvascular disease, your incidence of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, or cardiovascular death, or the composite of myocardial infarction, stroke, cardiovascular death, or hospitalization are all increased dramatically. So again, big in point. Now, once again, the relative in combination with aspirin was consistent for primary endpoints in both coronary artery disease and peripheral arterial disease. It was a 26% relative risk reduction in the coronary subgroup and a 28% relative risk reduction in the peripheral vascular group. Now, if we look at acute limb ischemia, and this was the slide I had. I don't know how that other jumped in here. But look at what happened in acute limb ischemia. Those who received aspirin alone, shown here in red, or aspirin, low-dose aspirin, coupled with Xarelto, shown here in blue, there was a 44% relative risk reduction in episodes of acute limb ischemia, and there was a 70% relative risk reduction in the need for amputation. Again, certainly dramatic results in these areas. So who can we treat? Who should we treat? Who must we treat? Uh, certainly, one could make the argument maybe all of these as we develop uh, the strategies, but there are some people who represent much higher risk. And so there were two various types of scores which were looked at to determine who was at highest risk. Using all the criteria evaluated within the REACH study, they came up with if one had two or more affected vascular beds, very high risk. Or if you had a history of heart failure, that uh, uh, pretended a very poor prognosis. And if you had renal insufficiency with a GFR less than 60, that's not really super low, is it? But anything less than 60 pretended a bad prognosis. Using CART criteria, the first two are the same. 
polyvascular disease, and a history of heart failure. But their third determinant was if one is a diabetic. Now, certainly I don't have a big study looking at this, but I can tell you I would have one other criteria that I think is probable that I plan to start looking at, and that is the patient who keeps coming back following an intervention with a thrombosed vessel. I think that represents a particular type of patient that we should look at. Now, we cannot and will not undercall what bleeds mean. Bleeds are serious. And the bleeds that were counted here by STH score were predominantly increased with non-fatal bleeds, not fatal. Because when I hear bleed, I always take a deep breath. Nothing worse than to put a patient on therapy and get called in the middle of the night. You've got an intracranial bleed. Or you've got a life-threatening bleed. But I want you to look at this data. And I didn't add color to this because I want you to look at what happens in terms of benefit and risk. So if we took the full compass uh, population and we looked at events per 1,000 patients over 30 months, what we can see is um, uh, there were uh, uh, there were there was much greater benefit. 23 uh, cases of benefit, uh, 23 per 1,000 patients versus two bleeds across the entire spectrum of this. In those who had polyvascular disease, uh, who probably in and of themselves were hypercoagulable from the get-go because there's more atherosclerosis that's exposed to circulating blood, they prevented 60 events with no extra bleeding at all. In those with a history of heart failure, they decreased 44 events uh, they, they had only uh, they decreased 44 actual events per thousand with no extra bleeding. In those with renal insufficiency, and as I've mentioned before, not all of these were severe renal insufficiency, and I yet do not have a breakdown on those that were ultra severe versus those that were severe uh, or just mild. Uh, again, 36 um, events were prevented for five bleeds. Uh, those with a history of diabetes, 31 events prevented with four extra bleeds. Any high risk, modified reach factor, 36 events prevented per thousand versus four bleeds. And any high risk heart failure, 33 risks, uh, 33 events prevented with only one bleed. I think this is very important because Everything that we look at is risk and benefit in medicine. When we go in to do an intervention, nothing is riskless. When we draw blood, it's not riskless. Everything we do carries a certain amount of risk. And the first tenement of the Hippocratic Earth Oath is first do no harm. And so I think it's very important we realize we don't want to do harm, but we can do harm by what we intend to do, or we can do harm by what we don't do because we miss preventing important events. And that's why it's always so important to look at how big is this risk versus the benefit gained. So with that, certainly we've identified some patients that can benefit. I did not want to go on and on in this because we really wanted to ask questions of you and allow questions. And at the end of this, we're going to ask you to re-answer those first questions that you were given and submit these, the same process that we used before, and we'll do these. So do we have any questions from the floor to start with? Or I can certainly reach out to some of our panel. Does anyone? We're, we're a pretty easy growing group. Nobody here bites at all. And uh, we're all in here together. You know, a big part of my getting interested in the peripheral space was access and other things. And all, then so much after this, I realized that if I didn't feel a foot pulse, I'd identified a patient at high risk of dying of heart disease. And that's very important because we often don't think of these patients as sick patients. They're quite sick, even if they're not having angina, they're at risk. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that's... Uh 
I think there are people that don't respond to Plavix. Um, I don't routinely test for it. Um, uh, I think that uh, nowadays with the rivaroxaban data, you know, I think that that probably trumps most of everything because you're going to be able to inhibit the clotting cascade a lot more effectively. Um, but certainly there's a there's a subgroup of patients that you put them on aspirin and clopidogrel and they keep coming back with repeated thrombotic events. And, and it gets back to what I always said before is that there's no standardized therapy for what to do after peripheral intervention. Um, you know, in the coronary world, I think we probably define that. You know, you could change them to prostagrel or, or, or something else. But there are people that believe that iliac stents don't need to have anything afterwards. I'm not in that camp, but I've heard people just say it. it's a big enough artery, there's torrential flow, you don't need to put them on anything after you put an iliac stent in. I think that's an interesting concept. Clearly, I think as you, the farther you go down the arterial tree, particularly in the tibial <coughs> arteries, when you're dealing with two, two and a half millimeter arteries, uh, CLI patients, you have a much more, uh, much less margin of error that even a minor amount of thrombus in those arteries is going to close the whole tibial artery, and you're going to be in a, in a, in a patient's going to be in a bad situation. So. Um, I think there's probably something to that, but I really don't uh, put a lot of credence into it. Yeah. I think it does play a role as well. It's, in, it's an important thing. You know, like you, I've asked the company, in fact, about what about a, a trial of Plavix plus this, because I agree with you. Uh, certainly Capri showed less bleeding and more efficacy, and yet that keeps being ignored. Aspirin always has a higher priority in terms of which drug to use. and. I know it's cheaper, but that's about all I think that we can easily say. Now, that's going to be an interesting question. The problem is, I, I, who wants to do another 65,000 person well, yeah, trial? That's, that's exactly and, it. And so that's some of the issue, and I suspect some of that's going to be left up to us as we move forward. But uh, kudos to them for doing this trial, because understand this took evaluating different doses. They didn't just look at 2.5, they looked at five, they looked at different things, and ultimately this was the dosage. Uh, that was utilized. And unlike aspirin, uh, uh, unlike atrial fib, where you're taking it once a day, they used a small dose, but twice a day, so that you had some coverage. That was what was shown to have benefit. It's, it's very impressive that they have all of these indications for use now. You know, everything from deep venous thrombo thrombosis prophylaxis through Treating, treating acutely ill patients, all of these indications, and each one has its own specific dose and how one should take it. Yeah, I think the bigger, the bigger issue is, is when you think about combinations of drugs, obviously you're trying to find the sweet spot between efficacy and safety, and there's really an infinite number of dosing and trial combinations you could come up with. And so it, it, there is some there is some science behind calculating kind of an educated guess on getting the right dose, but I, I remember when uh, Compass was published in 2016, I think, 17, uh, but it was presented at meetings before that, before it was published, and uh, I remember when I first heard about that, and, and, and there, the Voyager study was ongoing, but uh, it, <coughs> that data hadn't come out yet. I first said that makes a lot of sense to me. And I started using that that regimen in, in my patients, and the first time I prescribed that, about 10 minutes later, I got a call from the pharmacist saying, are you sure this is the right dose? This is a really small dose. Are you sure you didn't mean another drug? I, normally it's 20 milligrams once. I said, nope. I said, Google Compass data, Compass study. This is how I prescribed it. Please do what I ask you to do. And I dropped the mic and hung up on her. I can't imagine that. But uh, yeah, we have a question in the back. Uh, 81, uh, we are used to using aspirin. Is it as, as good as everybody Yeah, because it depends on what country you're in. Yeah. I, I think the effects of aspirin 80 to 100 are, are expected to be pretty similar. I don't, think, I don't think there's a lot of substantial difference there. We have a question in the back, Craig. Yeah, a question in the back. Yeah, Mohammed Zayed from Washington University. Terrific talks. Really enjoyed hearing uh, your insights on all this. You know, one of the major things that Dr. Dipple just mentioned is, you know, getting this approved by a pharmacist, the insurance company, and then on top of that, patient compliance. Whenever you're adding multiple medications to the regimens, particularly, you know, with expense, how do you get your patients to um, comply with these regimens? Any, any advice on this? And uh, what have you tried that's worked for you? And uh, 
you know, like these multi centaur trials that had over 60,000 patients, did they have a strategy to be able to maintain uh, good compliance? Yeah, they, they are, to be honest, what, what they have done, they helped people with the drugs in some of those trials to make sure they were on it. And they do have, they do have um, methods. We'll let the, the, you know, some of the folks comment on some of their programs, but they do have programs uh, to have this covered. And that's interesting. In this country, we have a sort of a perverse way that one gets drugs. If you are on Medicaid, Medicaid seems to pay for any drug that you want to use. If you're on Medicare and have paid taxes all of your life, uh, you may or may not get any drug you, when you, you <laughs> fall in donut holes. And if you have private insurance, those guys are all coming in begging for some kind of generic because they can't afford it. it. It is exactly the opposite of most of the world. So there are programs that help patients get it. And I must say, in general, when we explain the importance and what we're trying to prevent, uh, most of our patients have been reasonably good at complying. Uh, the ones that we have problems are when, and, and the company's pretty good about helping you with samples because they understand the issues of donut holes and things like that so that you can help your patients. Janssen has really been wonderful, at least in our lab, to work with. They have been very supportive, helping us keep patients on these medicines. And you know, these are the challenges that we face. You know, we hear about the shortcomings of American medicine, and some of that's because we paying for medicines for all around the world, not just for the U.S. Some of that is our system doesn't sometimes let us keep people on medicines that prevent other events. And we're totally geared to acute care and not geared enough to preventive care, which is more effective and cheaper. Greg, can I add a little bit to that? Sure, please. Um, one of the primary <laughs> authors uh, involved with both Voyager and Compass was Mark Benaka out of uh, Colorado. And I had heard one of his talks on this, addressing that directly, because costs of pharmacy are so high, especially with polypharmacy. <coughs> and he made a comment that the most powerful driver of changing a patient's attitude towards their, their health condition or the medications they take is when they have an event. So if they do have a heart attack, if they do have an intervention, at that point, that patient is willing probably more so than any other time in their life, to look at things in a different manner. So a lot of it has to do with the way we basically uh, put this to them, that their life from now on has changed in a certain manner. The good part is you're alive, first off. The second is you've still got your leg. The third, we're going to have to make some changes. So a lot of us can have a powerful event on how our patients look at their disease state by how we basically take things <coughs> in front of them. Instead of, here's another pill you got to take, here is something that may change your life. So I know it may cost some or it may take some work getting approval for it, but consider if it's worth it or not. John, that's a great point. You know, that was shown with smoking cessation as well in the past. If you discuss it during an event, probability that they'll quit smoking is about three times better than if you don't. And, you know, if one strikes while, while things are hot, you can absolutely change patient behavior much more effectively. Yes? A question regarding um, what you do in maybe a patient with, say, atrophib or DVT or PE who was on a, previous, uh, on a different NOAC and subsequently diagnosed with PAD, do you switch them from Eliquis or Pradaxa to Xeralto? And also, can you extrapolate the benefits of um, Xeralto from the Virgil or Compass to other NOACs? First off, I don't think that you should do that because this was a different dose. Secondly, it's more complex than you're saying because if they were on one before, what were they on it for? If they were on it for atrial fibrillation, 2.5 milligrams twice a day would not be an adequate dosage. Um, perhaps, perhaps you would, but, but again, we don't know if that equates to the COMPASS data. I, I don't think that, th that has not been studied. So, so let, let's start by saying that has not been studied. And I don't think we can easily answer that. But do understand, each of these was very tailored. Do I ever run across that situation I have? Is it common? It's, it's actually quite uncommon. 
in my experience, that they're on a different one. Often the bigger issue is if they want to come off of Coumadin and want to get on onto these other agents, particularly at the high dose. Um, and if they're on Coumadin for a shaky indication, if they're on Coumadin for a fib, then you're going to have to put them on the higher dose, either 20 or 15, based on the kidney function. If uh, this is being used for a DVT prophylaxis, it's 10 milligrams a day for given periods of time, based on what you're using, 10 milligrams to prevent prophylaxis in acutely ill medical patients not at high risk of bleeding. Uh, for acute DVT, it's or pulmonary emboli that are stable, it's 15 milligrams twice a day for three weeks, followed by 20 milligrams a day. So each one has a very different dosing regimen. Uh, and it's very difficult to just swap back and forth between those. But you have to make sure you cover, you know, whatever process one is covering. Next question. Yes, I see another question in the back. The online audience who's asking, what else would you suggest adding to an optimal therapy routine for PAD patient? They're currently on aspirin, vascular dose of Xarelto, a PCSK9, Vasipa, and they've got undergone IVIS guided interventions but still have long -term, poor long-term patency rates. What would you suggest? Well, that's, pretty, that's pretty good therapy right there. You know, we've, uh, so guideline-directed therapy would have initially been acutely dual antiplatelets probably, and that, that's what's recommended now, and, and then subsequently switching over to Xarelto plus aspirin. I suspect ultimately Xarelto may be, it, it have at least equipoise based on the data. Uh, that would be yeah. my guess, but we don't have that yet. The guidelines are not out. All of these patients should be on lipid lowering. Uh, statins are recommended. We all know not every patient can take a statin, but statins have pleiotropic effects above and beyond cholesterol lowering. They clearly affect and impact inflammatory response, and so they may have an additional benefit there. The patient is on a PCSK9 inhibitor, which is a, a superb way of really lowering LDL cholesterol, uh, but it's still recommended ideally if they can tolerate a statin, to have a dose of statin, probably above and beyond for some of the pleiotropic effects. And some would suggest, if they keep having these, that you may gain some benefit from vasodilators of some sort. Eric, any comments? Yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple things. First of all, the, the, um, the question I'm not entirely clear on, because if they're having recurrent events, are they having uh, acute limb ischemic events? If that's the case, I would be concerned about a mechanical issue, perhaps with the stent or the graft itself. That's something I'd also look at. Um, and so the question is is not uh, entirely clear. I don't know if they can clarify that as recurrent events. But having said that, one of the things that Craig mentioned is a, a frequent uh, drug that I use in a lot of these patients is salazazole. Um, I'm very liberal in the use of salazazole. Um, it has some beneficial effects uh, in stent uh, restenosis, also improving uh, the afterflow or the yeah. outflow. I, I want to just make one other comment because I was remiss to not mention this. If the patient keeps having those events, they should have a th thrombogenic profile yeah. performed because if one has antiphospholipid syndrome mm -hmm. or some of those yeah. areas, 10A inhibitors are not the treatment of choice. Those people do better with uh, vitamin K antagonists than they do with, with factor 10A inhibitors. So uh, if they're having these problems, you want to make sure that these patients are not thrombophilic patients. We often yeah, don't look for it's that. A, it, that's a complicated question yeah. to answer. It, it's yeah. not quite but But that's one yeah. you should look yeah, for. Yeah, I agree. John, you were going to comment and... Yeah, I just want to go back to the basics on this because... Um, <laughs> risk factor modifications. Yep. Uh, patients need to stop smoking if they're doing it. They may need to lose weight. Their diet is extremely important. And the benefits of exercise monitored therapy have been shown to be significant. So really, we need to look at it not just as a pharmacologic or intervention uh, treatment options, but also as to modifying what risk factors they may have. Yeah. You know, smoking cessation is really easy. Most of my patients have done it several hundred times. 
Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. One please. more question. So yes. uh, we, we had recently looked at our institution's use of um, subtherapeutic heparin, a homeopathic dosing of heparin. I know that's a common practice, um, not widely published about, you know, where you use a subtherapeutic dose in the setting of, you know, following acute surgery to prevent the risk of bleeding, but at the same time kind of <coughs> enhance patency. I'm, I'm interested, you know, by the fact that uh, uh, Zeralta is being prescribed in these studies at a homeopathic dose also, it, not the typical therapeutic dose. How did Janssen arrive at that dose, and what are your thoughts about the, the dosing yeah. paradigm? They started off with the, the trial, initial trial design was 5 milligrams twice a day, 2.5 milligrams twice a day with aspirin or aspirin alone. That middle arm was take, uh, the, the arm with 5 milligrams twice a day was less efficacious and had more bleeding, so they didn't follow it. So this is not a homeopathic dose. It is a different dose. And understand, giving a drug twice a day is very different than giving a drug once a day. So by being able to give it twice a day, they were really able to drop that dose quite a bit. Now, it did not provide the same level of anticoagulation that you have in atrial fibrillation, but it really dramatically dropped bleeding complications. There was a lot less bleeding in Compass than there was in, um, in Rocket, you know, looking at atrial fibrillation. This is clearly not homeopathic. You know, homeopathic means we're treating ourselves and it doesn't really have an impact on the patient. This had a profound impact. I mean, if we looked at diminished limb events, diminished cardiovascular events, diminished reoperations, this had an incredibly profound impact. And as, as I think Eric pointed out, I think this was a very, very important point that he made. The, cur the curves were still diverging. And most of these, Voyager was more acute patients. The same was seen in Compass, where you were dealing with chronic patients. Those were not acute patients across the board. And yet, as we continued to go out over time with these critical processes, uh, the data continued to get better. Not stabilized, but to get better. So I do think this is incredibly promising therapy as we move forward. And certainly, if we can throw in there, if these people have not been on agents to lower their lipids, if they've continued smoking, if they've done those other things which we know are problematic, and we can reverse those if we buy a little time. We also buy a little time for extra collateral to occur, for other things to occur. And so there are many very positive things that can happen over time if we can get by those acute events. That's why limb salvage and vessel patency are discordant. They're not the same. Often we restore flow, we save a limb, and once that wound closes, that patient does very well, even if the vessel shuts down. There is some angiogenesis. There are a lot of other things that go on. So again, we have to think of this differently than we think of other vascular beds. Yes? Are you aware of subgroups in the bypass patients, particularly with the prosthetics versus saphenous vein with this regimen? I, that was not yeah. broken out in the yeah, data. Yeah, I haven't seen I, I haven't seen that data uh, specifically. Uh, they, they may have that data, but I haven't seen it. Actually, though, it, yeah, it, it could it should have probably included all the above. And I think that was not broken out. Yeah, I think that's a great question, uh, and I but I don't know the answer to it. I actually looked for that data as well. Did you? I didn't see it. Yeah. Yes. So would you advise this is ready for prime time, like in our, in our everyday practice? Should we start this regimen? Should we start it on procedure day if we have a patient who's come in for a, um, a, a leg revascularization, even for non-CLI causes, like say for a, a claudicant who, who, who has decided to go on to uh, procedural revascularization, are we starting it on procedure day, and how long are we continuing this regimen? Sure. Is it indefinite or? Eric, why don't I let you take that question? I've been hogging this mic. I'll let you. Yeah, no, I, I think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, it, it is ready for prime time. I mean, you've got a 6,500 patient study that's been published in a major medical journal um, with very clear level of evidence that it's, it has benefit. Um, uh, and, and the benefit, like I said, gets better over time. The current strategy, I mean, if I pulled everybody in this room about what their current strategy is after an intervention, if I asked 10 different people, I'd get 12 different answers. And so 
there is no there is no guideline directed therapy on what to use for anticoagulants in patients. I'll give you a whole other example that's never been defined whatsoever is deep venous stenting. There's nobody will ever give you an answer. There's no data whatsoever on what's the appropriate anticoagulation after deep venous stents placed. And now you have four manufacturers on the market in the last 12 months that are all promoting their product and nobody can tell you how to anticoagulate these people. And so whether it's an iliac stent, an SFA stent, whether it's a clodican or CLI patient, the data is the data. It's very robust. Um, I think the only issue, in my opinion, is a practical issue that's been brought up, is trying to deal with insurance companies right now. That's the only practical problem that I have at all, is that there are some insurance companies that you fight and you fight and you fight with, and it's just, you end up, you know, then, then you, that's, that's the, the biggest hurdle yeah. right now. And the other would, of course, be patients at major risk of bleed. Of course, People yeah. People with active cavitation, pulmonary cavitation, active cancer, yeah. bronchiectasis, people who have, who have had prior bleeding diatheses. We could go through all of those. But, you know, that group who would represent a prohibitive cohort of bleed, I think it's probably not prime. You, you know, I mean, this is a pretty big study, 65,000 people. Uh, across the world is not a small study. That's, I mean, that takes a lot of work to yeah, put something like that I think it's, together. I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's good. And so, you know, and it takes guidelines a while to follow. So I don't think we can tell you right now that's guideline-directed therapy because well, guidelines could, often take a lot it, of time. It will become part we of We could it. say one, though. Yeah. Uh, recently, the American Diabetes Association has, include, has included the rivaroxaban, the low-dose aspirin therapeutic as one of their guidelines for PAD. Yeah. That was just published a few months ago. Yeah. So for at least with your diabetic patients, you have that. Great yeah, as far as, as, as far as the guidelines go in post-stenting patients for PAD, uh, clopidogrel is only a 2A, 2B recommendation. It, there's no recommendation, there's no class one recommendation <coughs> of any kind after peripheral endovascular intervention. There's no data that exists. Guys, you've been a wonderful audience. This has been a lot of fun for us. Um, it's always fun to get together with people. And, and I've got to say, it, as you're embarking your careers of dealing with peripheral vascular disease, critical limb ischemia, so many hurdles to learn. Learn the tools you, you use. Learn the, the disease process. Learn the ways to diagnose it. But for Christ's sakes, also learn the medical management. Get that first. And once you're there, then you can embark on the bigger things. I often speak with my fellows and others and say, you know, everyone wants to start somewhere around S or T instead of A in the alphabet. And if I have one bit of advice to make you, you a great peripheral interventionist in the future, start at A. Don't go out and start at T. Go out and learn the ABCs. Learn how to block and tackle and do routine things. Learn what wires are made of. Learn how to use them. Learn where one is appropriate or not appropriate. Learn how they can help you, how they can hurt you. Learn then your tools. Learn what are the pitfalls, what are good. Take each of these things one at a time. But for Christ's sakes, absolutely, pay attention to medical management. It's the beginning of everything here. And understand that peripheral vascular patients have more than just sick legs. They're much more at risk of thrombosis and acute Atherothrombotic events around the body. This has been known for many years from works of Newman, Robles, and others, and now it's even becoming more known. And certainly, it's a very important thing to address. Any comments from my co panelists in closing? I think you said it all. Well, if not, guys, thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you. Should questions arise in the future and you have anything you want, contact us. We're more than happy to help you. This is a field. That's still growing. It's a field that people are learning, and we'll do whatever we can to help you with that. Thank you so much. Thank you.